Chapman has been on a lifelong quest to eradicate waste. Since 1989, as an independent consultant, Ottman has been applying what she learned about consumer products marketing at Madison Avenue advertising agencies to helping businesses and the US government's Energy Star label market environmentally preferable products to consumers. Today, she runs a website called wehatetowaste.com, where she shines a spotlight on the best ideas from around the world for living what she calls trash-free and happy too. She is a member of the Manhattan Solid Waste Advisory Board. The board consists of 30 citizen volunteers who advise the mayor's Office of Sustainability, the Department of Sanitation, and the City Council on Solid Waste Issues. She is the founding chair of the board's Residential Recycling and Reuse Committee. They are currently addressing the particular challenges of encouraging residents in multifamily buildings to recycle, compost, and reuse. Please welcome Jackie Ottman. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my um, invitation to speak was a little bit last minute. I understand there was another speaker uh, that was scheduled in case anyone was expecting that speaker and on that talk. But you know, a last minute invitation to speak at Ethical Culture is still an invitation to speak at, uh, at Ethical Culture. So I thank you very much for the opportunity to step in and step up and share some ideas for how we can deal with New York City's ginormous trash problems. So as a little consolation for everyone who came this, here this morning expecting another speaker, I'm going to start with a poem. <laughs> no one told me I could, hold on, I got the glasses to deal with. No one told me I could take those board games from the trash. Just four years old, I instinctively knew if they were sitting at the curb, they could be mine. No questions asked. And what a trove it was could barely carry it all in my two little arms. Arrived at the driveway where my brother and sister were playing and proudly announced, look what I found down at the stands. They stopped what they were doing and looked at me in horror. You took those things from the garbage? Are you crazy? Crazy was not what I was thinking. Smart, clever, resourceful, creative was more like it. And it still is. <laughs> I'm Jackie Ottman, and 60 years later, I'm still dumpster diving. This is one of my most recent finds, this bookcase. Ha wait, I hold on. Can the AV person help me out for a moment? I just want to get this into full screen mode. Can you do that? I'll keep going. How many of you have a recent dumpster diving treasure to report? What have you got in the back? I took, a, took all the bookcases and turned them into shells. I love it. Anybody else? Come on, you got it, somebody else. Got a coffee table. You got a coffee table, there you go. Okay, so dumpster diving is, thank you sir. Dumpster diving is just one way to acquire things without shopping. Many of you no doubt agree that shopping is one of the reasons why we have so much trash piled up on our streets today. So this morning I'm going to ask what may sound like a heretical question to us Americans. What comes after shopping? I'm, I'm juggling a few things here, thank you. Uh, before presenting my ideas, here's, here's gonna be the schedule. Let's briefly review what exactly we're throwing away in all those black bags that line our streets on trash night. Then we're gonna touch upon some of the issues and challenges associated with the mayor's zero waste by 2030 plan. Hands up, how many people realize we do have a zero waste by 2030 plan here in the city? Okay, a few people, the rest of you gonna learn this morning, and then I'm gonna end up with some opportunities for all of us to get involved in finding solutions, including, spoiler alert, to stop shopping and start living what I call trash-free and happy too. Okay, are you all sitting down? We New Yorkers generate 25,000 tons of waste each and every day. 25,000 tons a day. 
We generate half of this in our homes, and the other half is generated by the city's businesses and indirectly by us in the offices we work in, the restaurants where we dine, the hospitals that put us back together again, and the bakers who bake our bread in the wee hours. Each of us generates nearly one ton of trash per year. Who says one person can't make a difference? 17% of that is recycled, and another 17% is incinerated. How many of us live on the west side? Okay, hands down. How many of us live on the west side? East side, east side. Okay, so nearly everybody here. Uh, the white garbage trucks that come to your curb to pick up the trash, they don't stop once they leave your curb. They go directly over the bridge to an incinerator in New Jersey with all of our trash. It's going to an incinerator. Pop quiz. How many incinerators are in New York City? Zero. Pop quiz. How many landfills are in New York City? None. So what does that mean? That means that all of this waste must be exported out of the city. What we don't recycle and what we don't incinerate it must be shipped out of the city through waste transfer stations that are now located in all four boroughs and Manhattan is going to open next year. It is then shipped by boat, rail, or truck to upstate New York, Seneca Falls, Pennsylvania, Virginia, Ohio, South Carolina, and other states. So, we're recycling only 17% of our waste, but a recently released study by the city tells us that a full 77% of our waste is recyclable. So, let's break this down. 34% of our total waste stream. So this is total discards, okay? This is everything that goes out, outside or that we're recycling. Is, so 34% is known as re curbside recyclables. That's what we're putting in the blue and the green bins, the paper, the bottles, and the cans. This is all required by law. But we're only collecting half of this 30%, and that's basically all we're recycling in the city is this half. So another 34% here, the orange, consists of organics that are suitable for composting. So that's food scraps, food soiled paper, and yard waste. But we're only getting a tiny bit of this and most of it's yard waste that's coming from Staten Island and some of the other boroughs. Uh, there's another 9% here in the purple. That's other divertible materials like plastic shopping bags, e-waste and clothing, all of which is recyclable. And then this last 29% in the gray consists of the other category, the proverbial other uh, category, non-recyclable, the diapers, the wooden pallets and furniture, the carpet and upholstery. So again, 77% of this is recyclable, but we're only capturing 17% of it now for recycling. And so when we're supposed to be on a road to zero waste, we've got a long way to go. So if you factor out what gets recycled, recycled, right, and you count up what we're throwing away, so really the equivalent of slicing up one of those black bags on the sidewalk, we'll find that 42% of what's in those black bags that we throw away is food. 42% of the black bags is food. Uh, we don't know how much of that food is edible, but what we do know is that it's being shipped away with the rest of what's in the bag to landfills in other cities at a cost of over $420 million per year. Much of the rest of what's in the bag, proverbial bag, are materials that are perfectly recyclable after this small section here. Uh, the 8% of it is clothing is in the black bags, recyclable clothing, 7% is junk mail, 6% of it is plastics, which are, of course, recyclable. So, what else is wrong with this picture? 
throwing away that material is a waste of natural resources, as, all, as you know, and creates pollution every step of the way from the time the materials are sourced until they wind up in a landfill and leach underground or send toxic uh, air pollution into the air. There's also ethical issues, too. Waste is shipped mostly to poor counties that are willing to mortgage their futures and their kids' health for some money today. And waste, as you probably read and saw in heartbreaking news this week about the whale, um, it also affects our marine life, and particularly plastics that don't break down in land and they don't break down in water either. The $420 million I mentioned may soon get a lot higher. The recycling industry is now in turmoil because of China's ban on recyclables. All the 10 states that we're sending waste to could soon hold our city hostage. What programs will we need to give up if export fees rise on the current trajectory to $1 billion a year by 2030? After school programs, the arts, education, it's all at risk. And the topper of it all is climate change. Just collecting and shipping our waste up and down the East Coast and in these trucks in the first place creates 2.2 million tons of carbon per year. All that food waste, the 42%, degrades into methane, a greenhouse gas that is 25 times more potent as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. And when we throw stuff away, we're throwing away all the carbon that's embedded in those products and food in the first place. I don't know how many of you have seen this chart before, but we all think that the solution to climate change is to shift to renewable energy. And that's a great solution, but it's not the primary one. The EPA tells us that the production of consumer goods and food, this big gray section of the circle generates more greenhouse gas emissions than the energy it takes to light our buildings and homes, fuel our cars and buses, and power even the highest energy star rated appliances and computers. So reducing consumption is the best way to address climate change, as well as for managing the natural resources, keeping waste to a minimum. Just one example. Taking one Starbucks cup each and every day for a year generates 87 pounds of greenhouse gas emissions, uses up 76 gallons of water, consumes 126 trees, and generates 12 pounds of solid waste. So recycling these cups sounds great, but it's a band-aid on the problem. You all know recycling is a manufacturing process and it has its own impacts. So we have to really reduce, focus on the reduce and the reuse before the recycle. I wish it were me who said it, but the greenest product is the one that already exists. So bring your cup to the Starbucks or order your coffee to stay. Now, to address these various issues, Mayor de Blasio has introduced on Earth Day in 2015, New York's Zero Waste by 2030 plan. Good for him and good for us. It's our first zero waste plan. So that makes us the largest city in America, perhaps the world, with a zero waste plan and puts us in step with other progressive cities. Its goal is to divert 90% of solid waste from landfill by 2030. How will it do this? Zero waste means that you really have a circular system like in nature. So if you design products and processes for maximum recycling and reuse, you can minimize the amount of resources that are coming into the system. You can also minimize the amount of waste coming out of the system. Ideally, instead of shipping resources out of state and to China, uh, you can keep more jobs and other economic opportunities right here in the city. For instance, thrift and repair shops. And if you're not manufacturing so many new products, you're cutting down on the pollution to manufacture new ones. 
Just a reminder, it takes how much? 90% less energy to make a can from recycled aluminum than it does to start from the bauxite. Now, a lot of this takes lifestyle changes. The recycling, the taking the bag when you shop, dropping your organics off in the green market. How many are dropping the organics off in the green market here? We should all be doing that. Um, oh, sorry about that. Thank you. Um, I got the papers on, this, on the <laughs> keyboard. Okay. So a lot of this takes lifestyle changes, like the recycling, the dropping off the organics at the green market. Do we New Yorkers have the stomach for this kind of change? Before addressing it, I'm going to give you a little sense to see how the mayor's plan is doing. The zero waste by 2030 plan is hitting some bumps in the road. Further expansion of the New York City organic program that allows us to drop off scraps in our buildings as well as the green markets is now stalled due to economic considerations and slow participation. Recycling in the NYCHA, 400,000 participants of NYCHA who never had to recycle before, but now they do, and in the schools, is slow. Electronics recycling is going well because New York State, as you know, put a ban on electronics in, in, in trash, uh, waste streams across the city, uh, across the state, and we have this e-cycle program in the buildings, et cetera, and drop-off events around the city. So we're, we're capturing a lot of those electronics right now, but clothing disposal is, is going slow, slow, slow. Thanks to fast fashion, clothing disposal is the fastest growing segment in the waste stream, and we're just not recycling this stuff fast enough. Secondly, and you're not surprisingly, industry is not cooperating. Talk about corporate social responsibility all you want, but at the end of the day, they are working with an entrenched economic system that rewards constant growth and short-term profits. One instance, the plastic bag bill that was passed by our city council in 2016 was eventually held up in Albany by none other than a Brooklyn state senator who had three plastic bag manufacturers in his district. I'll give you an update on that in a moment. We'll talk about the styrofoam ban in a moment. Uh, my personal issue as a marketing person is that government has allocated little or no money for education and culture change. Do you see an I Love New York campaign running for trash right now? No, I wish we did. Meanwhile, massive ad, ad campaigns continue to fuel consumption. So, solutions? There are some solutions. First, we have to learn more about the equity issues here in New York City, in Newark, and in those other states. Uh, one of my local heroes is Antonio Reynoso. He is the councilman from North, the district in North Brooklyn and the chair of the Sanitation and Solid Waste Committee. One of the reasons why he's in that job is because 60% of all the waste generated by New Yorkers and 70% of the organics goes through the waste transfer station in his district. Think of the number of trucks that are barreling through his district and the air pollution and the, all the rest of the issues and the kids with the asthma there. Secondly, we need to bring industry to the table and promote what is being called a circular economy. How many have heard of circular economy? So we need more deposits on more things. We need more bans like the e-waste ban, and we need what's known as EPR, Extended Producer Responsibility, requiring that the manufacturers of the products take them back for recycling, remanufacturing, repair. We also need, speaking of repair, right to repair laws passed. 19 states are now considering right to repair laws. We can talk more about that in the Q&A. 
We also have to encourage technology. Business has the potential to help reduce a lot of this waste. The waste stream here in New York City is actually a lot lighter now because most of us are getting our news through digital means rather than newspapers. What else can we reduce through technology? Business has the potential to come up with innovative designs and materials if they are so encouraged. We need products that are lightweighted, packaging that's compostable, made from recycled content so we can recycle more here in our city and forget dependence on the Chinese. And we need new business models that will make it profitable for businesses to sell us less stuff in the first place. This is possible. Thirdly, we need to put pressure on our state and local lawmakers to align the regulations and policies with the zero waste goals. Thankfully, a new plastic bag bill has been introduced as one example by into the state legislature by my state senators, Liz Kruger and Brad Oilman. We need more support for that consumer education and outreach. We did the culture change around smoking. We did the culture change around seat belts. We can do it around consumption too. And we need a holistic approach to lawmaking in our city council. It shouldn't just be the five hapless guys on the Sanitation and Solid Waste Committee who are dealing with these enormous problems. We need to link this to questions of climate resilience, health, environment, transportation, parks, and equity. And finally, here's what we all can do immediately today, is start doing a lot more reducing, reusing, and recycling in our own backyards in that order. We can influence others, and we need to lead. That's what I'd like to focus on for the rest of this presentation. And just before we go into some of my ideas, a little word of encouragement. It is possible to lead meaningful change in this city. How many are aware that five green moms on the Upper West Side, right in this neighborhood, got composting going in their children's public school? It became the inspiration for the organics collection program that we have now when Mayor Bloomberg got wind of this. This, by the way, is a post from We Hate to Waste, which Barbara kindly mentioned. There are 140 other inspiring stories up at We Hate to Waste that show the way forward. So the best place to start to change consumption culture is to reduce and reuse, as you all know. So continue to reuse the the bags, the bottles, the coffee cups, all great things to do. Doing these things helps raise consciousness and starts to embed waste reduction into our culture. But there's a lot more we can do than taking the bottle. It's what gets me out of bed every morning. And theoretically what it, it, it is, before I reveal it, is we need to start using the stuff we have more intensively and we need to stop accepting the premise that buying new is the default option when we need a new sweater or suit. In short, we need to share more. I see a particular opportunity here in New York City to share and reuse stuff within our densely populated neighborhoods starting in our own buildings. This is a picture, anybody know what this is? A tool lending library. Anybody read about how people are now borrowing tools from lending libraries instead of having to own them themselves? And there are many other great opportunities to share as well. I list them this way. To share, swap, borrow and lend, donate, gift, rent and lease, and buy and sell to each other. Why am I so keen on sharing? Sharing can help us live better. Think of the opportunities to get to know the neighbors. 
save money on some things so we'll have more money to spend on health care, education, and our retirement. How many people need to declutter? And we wouldn't have to remind our reluctant neighbors how they can save the planet. They'll be drawn in by the lifestyle benefits too. Now, I put many of these practices to use in my own building, and I founded that Residential Recycling and Reuse Committee at the Manhattan Solid Waste Advisory Board to figure out how to integrate these into all New York City buildings. So, here's a few examples of sharing at work in New York City and beyond. Sacramento now has a library of things. You can go into the library and borrow a guitar, a sewing machine, cookie cutters, and many other things. Now, how do you like that idea? Why not here in New York City? My dream is to walk into my 67th Street branch and borrow a pair of binoculars and a guide to the birds in Central Park. Does your building have a library yet? Anybody got a library? Raise your hands, way up high, okay? So one of the things that we're finding at the Manhattan Solid Waste Board is that many buildings have a little library downstairs or a sharing shelf, but nobody talks about it, but they're there. Here's on the right-hand side here is the library that my super and I created 10 years ago in our laundry room. All we did is drag in a bookcase one night that we literally found in the trash and everybody loves it as you can imagine. How about a free stuff box or a sharing stuff shelf? Anybody got a sharing shelf in their building? Okay, you know the folks in Park Slope are always leaving stuff out on the, the stoop. Why can't every apartment, office, dormitory, and senior center in New York City have a simple box where people can take stuff and leave stuff and take stuff? I put a note under the door on my floor, 12 apartments, letting neighbors know what I was willing to share. And now Rita drops by every Friday morning to pick up the vacuum cleaner. And Abigail, the neighbor, doesn't have to, uh, who she works for, doesn't have to go buy an $800 Electrolux vacuum cleaner she's got access to right on the other side of the wall. Anybody here have any food in their fridge right now of risk of going to waste? Anybody concerned about that? Why not invite the neighbors in tonight to have what I call a leftover pooling party? create some community, and have some fun. By the way, we have to rebrand things like potluck suppers for the next generation. We have to let the millennials think they invented this stuff. <laughs> not up for a party? Why not just put your extra food in a community refrigerator? This one, community refrigerators are cropping up all over Europe as a way to feed the hungry. How about a community fridge or just one shelf in the fridge in the office? Just whose moldy sandwich is sitting in the back now? Okay, so you may be saying, hey Otman, these ideas are great, but where's the real impact gonna come from? The impact comes, ladies and gentlemen, when business sees an opportunity to make money by bringing these ideas to scale. Zipcar started out, do you know this is an initiative of an environmental group in Germany. Now it's all over the world and all over the city because one businessman saw an opportunity to make it accessible to everyone. I don't know the exact statistics, but for every person, for every zip car that's out there, there are like 12 fewer cars on the road because people do not have to own cars. They can make more intensive use of the cars that we already have. Of course, there's eBay. Rent the runway so you can rent prom and wedding dresses rather than buy them new and wear them once. And next up, is nextdoor.com. How many people are registered at nextdoor.com? Okay, here's go home, get right on to nextdoor.com. 
There's Facebook for friends, LinkedIn for your business colleagues, and now there's Nextdoor.com for the neighbors. I've been on Nextdoor.com for a couple of years ago. I'm in a reading group. I have dropped off things for neighbors when I put a note up saying, would anyone like these mirrors? People are up there buying and selling and letting people know that there's things that they uh, are willing to give away. Um, this is buy the stock when it goes public. There's a little stock tip for you. This is going to be huge. So that's a few ideas. Now let's talk measurement. They say measurement is the key to success. How will we measure this? How should we be measuring the sustainability of our lifestyles here in New York City? We already measure how much we recycle, but why not look at how much we're reusing and sharing? Why not measure how much of our consumption is composed of items that are reusing instead of buying new? The city should be measuring that in addition to recycling. How about a product longevity index? How long does a typical basket full of items that we buy here in New York City actually last? They say it's about six months and some items last a minute before we throw them away. Product longevity is a function of the quality of what we buy. It's also how well we maintain our things, the availability of repair services, as well as the will to wear our clothes just a little while longer or buy classic styles. And then there's sharing. What percentage of all the products that we use in our household in a year are not owned by us, but are shared with others in our building or borrowed from our neighbors? And finally, my favorite one is connectedness. How connected are we to those neighbors on the other side of the wall? Just how many of our neighbors do we interact with over the course of a month? or for a year that matter, for that matter. Couldn't we all use some new friends? So, in conclusion, we live in a very wasteful city and our waste is creating many issues and long-term risks. We have a zero waste plan in place that needs attending to now. Meanwhile, we can all do our part as individuals, as citizens, as consumers, and as leaders in our communities and in our buildings. So it's up to us, get up to speed on these issues and work to make lasting change through policy and innovation and behavior change. Let's start to accelerate cultural and social change by starting today to share, swap, borrow, donate, rent, buy, and sell to each other. Let's start in our buildings, improve our lives, prove this concept, and invite the market to bring it to everyone. So, as a thank you for putting up with me instead of the intended speaker, I'll end with another poem. It's called, The Sharing Closet to Be. One of these days, the closet down the hall that's now marked compactor and recycling will be labeled sharing closet. The trash chute will be boarded up. The closet will be freshly painted and smell like new. In that closet will be a Miele vacuum cleaner, an iron and ironing board, a 30 cup coffee maker, a deck of cards or two, an espresso maker and a tool kit. Residents will be free to borrow stuff as they choose, putting it back in a timely manner for others to use. The building or perhaps Home Depot will be responsible for maintaining the stuff. And everyone will say, why didn't we think of this sooner? Thank you very much. <laughs>